Mm-hmm. Okay. The ongoing discussion about who God is and who Jesus is points to the fact that somehow we've lost our way. 1900 years or 2000 years later than Jesus, we still, still seem to be in doubt as to how to define God and to define Jesus. Everybody involved in this discussion should certainly read Christology in the Making by Professor James Dunn. Christology in the Making, uh, I think 1980, his first edition. He really lays out the issues beautifully for us. I'm representing a point of view which says that uh, Jesus quoted the Shema, the hero Israel. That's actually the favorite verse of Jesus. Somebody's remarked that different denominations have different favorite verses, like John 3.16 for the Billy Graham crowd, like Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the Church of Christ, and so on. You might ask the question, what was Jesus' favorite verse in Scripture? Well, that question was asked of him by a friendly Jew, and Jesus replied, listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, or we can render that equally well. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one person. Is masculine. The Lord is one person, one Yahweh. It doesn't make any difference which way you translate it. The conclusion is quite clear that Jesus was a unitary monotheist. Now, this is just a little bit embarrassing for the Christian church because somehow we've given up on Jesus at the level of his most favorite verse. James Dunn analyzes all this beautifully. And he comes to the conclusion that Paul did not believe in a pre-existent Jesus. And when he gets to John, he wonders about John 1. But I wanted to read from this excellent book on page 243, Christology in the Making, James Dunn's conclusion about John 1, because this is always the passage that is brought up to us. Surely John 1 tells you about in the beginning was the Son of God, God the Son. Well, it actually doesn't say that. It says in the beginning was the Word, Logos. No need to put a capital word, capital W there. That's an editorial imposition onto the text. Let me give you a sample from James Dunn here, page 243 of his celebrated book, Christology in the Making, this about John 1. He says, The conclusion which seems to emerge from our analysis of John 1 is that it's only at verse 14, that's the verse that says that the word became flesh, only with that verse 14 that we can begin to speak of a person logos, a personal logos. That's exactly right. The poem uses rather impersonal language, became flesh. But no Christian would fail to recognize a reference in verse 14 to Jesus Christ. The word became not flesh in general, but Jesus Christ. That's quite clear. The word became flesh is obviously a reference to Jesus. Now listen carefully to what James Dunn has to say. Prior to verse 14, we are in the same realm as pre-Christian talk about wisdom and logos, the same language and ideas that we find in the wisdom tradition and in Philo, where, as we've seen, we're dealing with personifications rather than persons, of course. In the beginning was wisdom. In the beginning was word, personifications, not God the Son, not a person. We're dealing, says James Dunn, with personified actions of God, his wisdom at work, his word at work, rather than an individual divine being as such. Please note then that James Dunn does not think there's a God the Son when we read in the beginning was the word. If we translated Logos as God's utterance rather than capital word, everything would be clear. It would become clearer, says James Dunn, that the poem, John 1, did not necessarily intend the Logos of verses 1 to 13 to be thought of as a personal divine being. In other words, the revolutionary significance of verse 14, the word became flesh, may well be, I would say certainly is, that it marks not only the transition in the thought of the poem from pre-existence to incarnation, but also the transition from impersonal personification to actual person. And with those marvelous words, James Dunn has solved the problem. There's no contradiction between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at all, provided we don't read into John 1 ideas about God the Son. It doesn't say in the beginning was God the Son. It says in the beginning was the Word, small w, logos, word. 
utterance, wisdom, word of God, intention, plan, scheme, grand design of God. Now that grand design, which was not another person than God, it was God's own wisdom, his wise activity, that personification, if you like, not person, became a human being, only in verse 14, and that human being is Jesus Messiah. So Jesus, if you like, is walking word. He's walking wisdom. He never claims, however, to be God the Son. That would make two gods, and immediately then we're in trouble with the Shema, the hero of Israel, which quite explicitly declares God to be one single person. The Jews, as surely everyone knows, were unitary monotheists, not Trinitarian monotheists. And that's where the whole discussion needs to center now. Allow Jesus to be a Jew, allow him to recite the Shema, and let us, as followers of Jesus, agree to obeying Jesus and obeying the Shema. What a marvelous uh, event would occur if we did this. We could then open the discussion with Muslims and with Jews, and the whole of the conversation would be transformed.